Thank you, Eckhart, and thank you everybody for sticking around for the very last presentation of the last panel. Um, the title of my paper is A Growth Regime's Perspective on Canada's Transition to Private Debt-Led Growth Since the Global Financial Crisis. And Canada is an interesting case study for growth regimes analysis because of its distinct trajectory before and after the global financial crisis. So before the global financial crisis, um, amongst journalists, politicians, uh, some economists, uh, there was a frequent celebration of the exceptionalism of Canada's policy regime. Um, basically since the late eighties and going into the nineties, uh, Canada led the way in its embrace of uh, basically neoliberalism and financial globalization. So the Bank of Canada pursued inflation targeting since 1991. It was second only to New Zealand uh, in implementing that. Uh, there was a great deal of labor market flexibility uh, policy. Uh, the idea of balanced budgets and uh, public debt reduction became hegemonic. And um, most particularly, Canada pursued a strategy of integration into the world economy by means of free trade agreements. So first of all, with the US in 1988, and then with the US and Mexico, so NAFTA in 1994. Um, so then after the crisis, however, um, things started to look a lot different for Canada. Um, not only did growth slow um, and become quite weak, uh, but then there's been this buildup of private debt and in particular household debt in Canada. So for example, the IMF has started to warn um, here, household debt exceeded 170% of disposable income. Uh, sorry, I can't read the full quote on my screen here because of the, um, sorry, can I just move this around? Sorry, okay, there we go. Uh, household debt exceeded 170% of disposable income in 2019 one of the highest levels among G20 countries. Uh, and also for non-financial corporations, their debt to assets and debt service to income ratios were the highest among the G7. So before to turn to growth regimes analysis, um, let's consider uh, CPE, but uh, perhaps a different CPE than um, what is related to in most of the post-Keynesian literature. So not comparative political economy, but Canadian political economy. Uh, so yeah, there exists in Canada a longstanding tradition of heterodox scholarship, basically um, from economists, political scientists, sociologists, other social scientists uh, to study Canadian political economy. And there are a few approaches that are worth mentioning here. Uh, the first is the Can Canadian variant of dependency theory. Uh, on the one hand, um, you know, decades ago, there was a big focus on foreign ownership in the Canadian economy. Um, there's also a variant within this school focusing on staples theory. So the role that primary commodity staples exports plays in the Canadian economy. Uh, second, there is a school of Marxism. Um, the central concept is accumulation. Uh, and then there are various political economy sort of uh, additions to that. So this can be linked to the state, uh, linked to corporate power, or linked to the internationalization of Canadian capital. Um, and then lastly, there's the capitalist power school. Uh, so this is a more recent approach um, and um, contributions there investigate uh, the idea of differential accumulation of dominant capital. Uh, and they also link that to um, trends in distribution. So each of these approaches has different concepts and methodologies. My point is not to go into them, except to say that they exist and that they all improve our understanding of Canada. And just to maybe motivate our, the growth regimes analysis, which will follow, here's one of the figures from the literature, um, which shows the structural transformation of the Canadian economy over the period that we're gonna consider. So this uh, figure plots um, the share of staples of uh, total merchandise exports and this uh, V or this U, uh, we can see that the share of staples uh, was over 65% around 1980. And then uh, it declined over the next two decades, uh, falling to 42% around the year 2000. And then after the turn of the century, uh, there's a dramatic rise again in the share of staples exports um, to over 60% by 2010. 
So on the left side of this V, that reflects the fruits of industrial policy, um, which promoted higher value added uh, production and exports. Um, on the right side of this V, uh, that reflects the abandonment of industrial policy and, uh, and also the start of the 2000s commodity boom. We can also look at this other figure from the literature with, um, which shows the way that Canada has integrated itself into the global economy and patterns and its patterns of trade. Uh, so I already noted that the free trade agenda started in the late 80s, um, in 1988, and then NAFTA was signed in 1994. Uh, so what we see has occurred is that the signing of NAFTA has allowed Canada to run uh, at least until the global financial crisis. I mean, this is a dated figure um, to run a massive uh, uh, trade surplus with the USA or the US. Uh, and then in most years, uh, trade deficits with other regions of the world, um, except for a bit of the UK, a, a very tiny trade surplus with the UK, which is the uh, pink, pink squares. So my uh, approach or given this context, my approach is to provide a post-Keynesian contribution to Canadian political economy. And as we know, uh, post-Keynesianism, uh, you know, permits a demand-centered approach. And as we have seen in these workshops, um, I'm going to deploy the methodology of growth regimes. This gives us this uh, typology based on patterns of sectoral financial balances and growth contributions. Uh, these give us the sources and financing of demand. Uh, so that allows us to see what has changed. And then uh, I use the macroeconomic policy regime methodology to try to explain uh, why we have seen these changes. And this macroeconomic policy regime shows us the demand effects of each node of policy. So monetary, fiscal, and incomes policy, as well as uh, open economy conditions. Uh, I won't go into the details of each type of regime because we have seen these in depth over the last two days. Uh, I'll just say, we have an export-led mercantilist regime, uh, weekly, ad, uh, weekly export-led regimes uh, with two sub-variants, a domestic demand-led regime, and a debt-led private demand boom regime. So um, here are my results. And it's to really encompass that whole period of uh, neoliberals, neoliberalism that I described, I conducted the analysis over four economic cycles. Uh, so there's one from 1983 to 1991, a second from 1992 to 2000, a third from 2001 to 2009, and the fourth from 2010 to 2020. Uh, these are identified basically on the movement of unemployment, uh, as well as looking at, uh, I guess, the technical definition of a recession. So in the first regime, um, uh, we have a domestic demand-led regime. Um, uh, sorry, just to make sure I get this right. So we see the household sector is in surplus. This is matched by public sector deficits. Domestic demand contributes positively to demand growth, while the balance of goods and services provides small negative contributions to growth. Uh, so this is an interesting regime because we see that there is an external surplus um, that coexists with negative net exports, or sorry, positive net exports. Uh, so the former implies a current account deficit, and the latter in general is associated with a current account surplus. Uh, so this uh, peculiar finding can be explained if we look at the current account data by the subaccounts and the deficit of primary income, which drives the negative current account uh, in the 1980s. So going back to that school of dependency, um, that is reflective of the issue of foreign ownership and the net outflows of, uh, of profit, uh, interest, uh, and so on. In the second cycle, uh, we see a transition to a rising, what I call a rising weekly export-led regime. Uh, so this was the heyday of neoliberalism. The external sector is in surplus and the domestic sectors as a whole are in deficit. But here, the growth contributions of exports are uh, positive, and hence this uh, rising export-led regime, weekly export-led regime with uh, improving net exports and falling current account deficits. And that is exactly what we see in the current account data here uh, throughout the 1990s. Uh, 
In the third cycle, we see a transition to what I call a falling weekly, weekly export-led regime. Here, the positions are reversed. The external sector is in deficit and the domestic sectors as a whole are in surplus. The growth contributions of net exports are negative. Hence, we see falling or stagnant net exports and current account. We can note two interesting phenomena during this cycle. Uh, first, the public sector uh, goes into surplus uh, for the first time uh, in our period of analysis. Uh, and we also see that the financial balances of households uh, go substantially negative. Uh, for both of these, if we um, go to figure two, which is sectoral financial balances. Uh, so we're looking at the third cycle, which is 2001 to 2009. We can see that actually it starts slightly before uh, in that during that second cycle actually, but for both of them, um, they become long-term trends in our third cycle. Finally, the fourth cycle, we see the emergence of a debt-led private demand boom regime. The external sector reverts back to a surplus position and the domestic sectors as a whole are in deficit. These deficits are driven in particular by the deficits of the household, uh, as well as the public sector. The domestic sectors contribute positively to growth while the balance of goods and services contribute neutrally. And for the first time we observe um, an average of negative net exports in this cycle. And just to look at the evolution of household debt here and the character of this debt-led regime. Um, here we can see the household sector debt to GDP ratios. Canada is the orange line and the advanced economies aggregate is the blue line. So during the 2000s, uh, Canada more or less follows the same trajectory as its peers. Uh, but then after the global financial crisis, there's deleveraging in much of the for many advanced economies, whereas in Canada, the household debt continues to rise. So having diagnosed sort of these, uh, these changes in the Canadian uh, growth regime, um, we can look at the macroeconomic policy regime. Um, so as I already mentioned, this gives us a sense of the demand effects of each note of policy. Uh, so just very briefly, I can say, um, you know, monetary policy in this uh, post Keynesian view uh, should target a slightly positive real long term interest rate that is equal or less than real GDP growth to foster investment and support, support demand. There's a role also for financial regulation and stability. Incomes policy should support nominal stabilization by linking unit labor cost growth to the target rate of inflation. And fiscal policy should act counter cyclically to stabilize demand at non inflationary full employment. There is a role also for redistribution. Uh, and public investment to encourage growth. Um, the external sector um, ideally should be close to balance as well uh, to avoid the buildup of the current account deficits that we have seen in financialization. So for my results, we have two tables here. Uh, the first shows all the indicators across every cycle. And the second, uh, we already saw a similar uh, one from Juan's presentation. Um, and the second table shows the uh, assessment. So in a stylized way, this uh, tells us about kind of some of the factors that explain these shifts in the Canadian economy. So in this first cycle, we see that, that the macroeconomic policy regime uh, relied very heavily on fiscal policy. Uh, fiscal policy acted in an expansionary way. Uh, whereas all the other nodes of policy acted in um, a con contractionary way. Uh, regarding the open economy conditions, uh, Canada saw um, currency appreciation uh, and hence there was uh, an impact on price competitiveness. Um, then, you know, in this context, it's unsurprising that the domestic demand led regime at the time was unsustainable. Uh, then we see uh, a change starting in the second cycle, uh, which we can recall was a rising weekly export led regime. Um, we essentially see the same macroeconomic policy regime um, in terms of the stance of policy, but what changed was um, the open economy. Uh, so here, um, 
the export and import shares grew rapidly in the context of free trade. Um, and the depreciation of the Canadian dollar, uh, as well as a respectably high economic complexity index. Uh, I can go back uh, here. Um, along with the economic complexity index, um, it supported the emergence of a weekly export led regime. Uh, in the third cycle, uh, we see wage and incomes policy uh, change in a sense uh, because uh, nominal unit, unit labor costs grew faster than CPI. Um, although it was still contractionary in the sense that the wage share continued to fall. Uh, the key change um, again was the open economy. We saw uh, a significant appreciation of the Canadian dollar and this corresponds with the observed increase in the import share. At the same time, the export share continued to rise despite decreases in both price competitiveness through currency appreciation and non-price competitiveness, uh, the complexity index. And we can look at figure five to help us make sense of this. So this shows Canadian GP growth vis-a-vis -vis its major trading partners. Uh, and so during the 2000s cycle here, uh, Canada grew faster than most of its major trading partners, except for China. Uh, and in particular, it was growing faster than the United States. Uh, so the United States is by far Canada's largest trading partner. Uh, so that's the important relationship that we should be looking at here. Then in the fourth cycle, we see um, a quite significant change in Canada's macroeconomic policy regime. Basically every node of policy becomes expansionary. Uh, the short-term interest rate turns negative and the negative differential between the long-term rate and GDP growth makes monetary policy wholeheartedly expansionary. Incomes policy turns expansionary um, with unit labor costs growing faster than the Bank of Canada's uh, target inflation rate. The wage share for the first time sees a slight increase. Uh, fiscal policy uh, becomes a bit more erratic because our indicators, um, our structural balance and output gap indicators move in opposite directions. But on the other hand, public investment uh, becomes quite high, uh, far higher than any of the other periods uh, that we've looked at. Open economy conditions improved from the perspective of price, price competitiveness. Uh, there's some currency depreciation, but net exports nonetheless turn negative. This is also puzzling from the perspective of the figure that we've looked at because Canadian growth here in many years was slower than the United States um, and its other trading partners. Um, and so part of that explanation is the continued decrease of non-price competitiveness, non-price competitiveness. Uh, so if we look here at the OEC economic index here, this third row from the bottom, uh, we see a long-term decline in um, uh, over the periods that we have looked at. So, um, you know, overall, we can look at this really, really kind of long-term, you could say long durée evolution of the macroeconomic macroeconomic policy regime as contextualizing the shift to a debt-led private demand boom regime. So most directly expansionary monetary policy uh, supported the accumulation of private debt. Um, growth was supported in this cycle by expansionary turn of monetary and incomes policy, as well as currency depreciation. But this growth was middling compared to Canada's major trading partners. Fiscal policy, um, um, supported um, supported uh, growth as well. Um, but compared to previous cycles, um, deficits were smaller uh, than what we've seen. So if we go back here, and let me go back to the financial balances of the public sector. There were public sector deficits, but they were far smaller than what we saw in the first or second cycles. So accordingly, although it had an expansionary um, at least partially an expansionary effect. Uh, this was ins insufficient from the perspective of sectoral balances to support deleveraging of the household sector. Um, and the failure of currency depreciation to stimulate exports uh, can be explained by the structural transformation of the economy. The decline of this economic complexity index reflects the orientation of the productive structure towards the extraction and uh, export of staples. Uh, and then with the end of the 2000s commodity boom and the collapse in particular of oil prices in 2014, uh, Canadian exports have faltered. Uh, 
so just to sum up, um, this is my attempt to provide a post-Keynesian contribution to Canadian political economy. And I have been able to diagnose a series of growth regime shifts. And we've looked at some of the conditions of the macroeconomic policy regime, uh, which have played a role uh, in these changes. Uh, so um, uh, that is the state of my research. And I look forward to any questions, comments, uh, or suggestions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ted.